Anya Parampil joins us now. Anya, it seems like a lifetime ago uh, when we used to talk every night uh, during the every week day. on the uh, television. So much, yeah, so much has happened since then, not the least of which you've written a blockbuster, Corporate Coup. Tell us what it's about. Thanks so much, George. Yeah, people probably mostly associate me with video, but for the last two and a half years, I've worked to compile my reporting on Venezuela, the failed, absurd attempt to install a government, coup government in Caracas before an actual they, they, where they announced, they rolled out the regime change mission accomplished banner before they'd actually changed the government. Uh, beginning in 2019 with this recognition of Juan Guaido as president by the U.S. and its allies. I compiled my reporting, which I, I spent over three months in Venezuela over the course of two years. I developed close relationships with people on all different sides of the political spectrum. Obviously, people have seen my interviews with members of the government, but I also maintain good connections on the opposition side, surprisingly enough. I also built relationships with people working in the U.S. financial sector, the international oil sector, and U.S. Po political side as well to produce original investigative report, a report that I think isn't just about Venezuela. It's about using the Venezuela case to understand modern U.S. hybrid regime change tactics, what they use, what the West uses to target so-called enemy countries that resist the Washington consensus when they can't use traditional military tactics. So that's the diplomatic assaults, unprecedented diplomatic assaults that the U.S unleashed upon Venezuela, including seizing its embassy, sovereign embassy in Washington, D.C. The covert destabiliza destabilization tactics the U.S. uses, for example, the failed mercenary invasion of Venezuela that took place in May of 2020, the propaganda and information war, which is key, as, as your viewers will know, understanding and dissecting how the mainstream media participates in or how, how they participate in the overall program of regime change basically act as foot soldiers for washington and its allies and putting forward a narrative that reinforces the the western line and ultimately Oh, and the economic sanctions as well. Financial terrorism being the number one, I think, tactic the U.S. has leaned on since it became less able to wage conventional warfare. What this book does is explain how that network works, illustrating it through Venezuela. For example, I show how sanctions systematically destroy the economy. And, and this is a playbook that then is, again, applied to, you can apply it to Iran, to Moscow, to even Kiev, obviously, the Maidan coup is the same blueprint. You, using USAID and these human rights organizations to really just further U.S. and Western financial and corporate interests in these foreign countries. So I tell that story, but ultimately where I end is that the U.S., the West, this transatlantic nexus has gone too far. And what the book also focuses in on is how developing powers, Russia, China, Turkey, India, and Venezuela are coming together and forming or have come together to form an alternative to the Western centered financial system. And I believe that a multipolar world is inevitable. It's here. And this book tells some of that story and ultimately makes the case that the U.S. should grow up and learn how to participate in the multipolar world, because I think we in the U.S. would be better off if our government gave up on this imperial project. One of the common denominators of all the cases you cited there, and you might have added Iran 
is that they were all, in the end, complete failures. Uh, Iran wasn't brought down. Venezuela was not brought down. Russia isn't being brought down. In fact, its economy is doing rather better than most of ours, if not all of ours. Uh, these uh, tried and tested methods are all complete failures. Uh, at what point does the Washington establishment say, well, look, these things may or may not have been worth trying, but they've all failed. It's time to come up with a new routine. That is the question that I ask myself every day, and that's what drives me to do this work, to sit here in Washington, D.C. and try to get the attention of policymakers and say, look, this is backfiring against, even on a practical point, our own interests as the United States. And I can I can give you an example. You're right. All of these, the targeting of Iran and Venezuela and Russia are particularly important because it feeds directly into what we just saw at the BRIC summit in Johannesburg, which I covered. Many people in the West may have been surprised that U.S. allies, such as Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, actually took steps to join BRICS, which is regarded as this alternative to the IMF transatlantic financial network. And really, I wasn't surprised because what I have and what I detail in the book is how over the course of the last 10 years, by targeting Iran and Venezuela particularly first, these are two major oil producers. The U.S. has destroyed Venezuela's oil sector through sanctions, and I detail how in the book, so much over recent years that people might not even realize that for most of the last century, Venezuela was a top, if not the top, oil producer in the world. They have the largest oil reserves in the world. In fact, you might be interested to learn this tidbit. I certainly was. In 1942, by the time the U.S., actually became involved in, in World War II, Venezuela was supplying London with 80% of its oil exports or imports. And the UK was entirely reliant on imports at the time uh, to fuel its military. And so without Venezuelan oil, the allied victory in World War II may have not even been possible. And that's the level of wealth and concern that London and Washington have for Venezuela, they know this, that this is a key base that they need to maintain control over. And so once Chavez came in and began asserting authority, uh, sovereign control of their resources, they unleashed this economic assault that did really damage their oil production capability. Now, the U.S. thought that this would eventually lead to their government falling. But no, over time, Iran, China, and Russia have stepped in to start revamping Venezuela's oil production capacity. And I think Venezuela will get back to where it used to be. But by cutting Iran and Venezuela out of the Western financial network, literally cutting them off from US dollars, we thought, oh, that's just going to lead their governments to collapse. No. When you have China and India as major oil markets, major importers, they'll just buy Venezuelan oil, which is what happened. And if they're not using the U.S. dollar to do so, then we're already introducing an alternative to the U.S. petrodollar within the oil producing network. Same thing with Iran. Hasn't used the U.S. dollar to sell its crude since 2015, I believe. And so they've already been using the euro, using other currencies, using their own national currencies to sell their oil product. Now, under the Biden administration, we cut Russia out of that same network, limited their access to dollars. And what that means is we've targeted three, well, and if you add what we've done to Iraq over the last uh, two, two decades, we've targeted the major founders of OPEC. About three out of the five, we've cut out of the Western financial system and suffocated them, uh, cut them out of dollars. So now tell me, if you're Saudi Arabia and you see this going on, you know that people are already not trading in the dollar and that India and China are emerging markets that are not going to be controlled by the West. They're going to have their own sovereign policy. They're going to buy oil from whoever they want. Well, does it make sense for Saudi Arabia to continue only trading their oil in the dollar if that's the case? Do we think that Saudi Arabia and the UN 
United Arab Emirates that their leaders might be sitting around and thinking, you know, 10 years from now, do we really want to be completely reliant on the United States and Europe? Do we want to have our own sovereign identity? And will they ever punish us even if we assert our own authority? Will they weaponize the dollar mm -hmm. and weaponize the oil trade network against us? I think they saw the writing on the wall. Yes, of course. Washington will come for you eventually. And so it's no surprise then that this shift is taking place. I think the people in Washington who crafted these policies forgot basic physics. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And now they're starting to see for the first time really since the end of World War II, the world is reacting. And what goes up uh, must come down. With wonderful piquancy, President Maduro, uh, whom I knew when he was a, a bus driver, uh, is now getting a red carpet welcome in Beijing as we speak. Finally, Anya, the point about politics is to persuade others who hitherto had not agreed with us of the correctness of the point of view that we have and how we reached it. And you have done that to a remarkable extent because I saw on the blurb on your book no less than Tucker Carlson say that he had substantially borrowed from your point of view as he now views international affairs. I mean, I, I knew you were good, but that's really remarkable. Tell us who else is on the book? Who else has endorsed it? I'm very, I, I was so floored and just grateful to get that statement from Tucker. And I, I, I also feel fortunate to call him a friend. I, I'm surprised that a few people have responded and said something like, oh, no thanks, I'm not going to buy the book because Tucker blurbed it. Look, that's your problem, not mine. He's the most popular television host in the history of the United States. So, I mean, as you say, I'm not trying to reach the same 50, 100 people that I know from Venezuela Solidarity in the United States who always show up for Venezuela and who I'll continue to see in those networks. No, I want to reach all people with this message because it's also just about my country and what I think would be best for my country. And it would be to break away from this crazy transatlantic nexus and be a sovereign, normal country and deal with the world like an adult. I think everybody would be happy, including the U.S. public, if that happened. I. Roger Waters, Oliver Stone, and Francisco Rodriguez is a very important endorsement, actually. People might recognize the other names more because they're celebrities, but I'm I'm so grateful for, for Francisco's endorsement, particularly because he's someone who's not only very respected in foreign policy circles in, in academia in the United States, but he actually served as an advisor to the last opponent to Maduro in the 2018 election. So he comes from an anti-Chavista, anti-Maduro background. And I think I'm considered a pro-Chavista, pro-Maduro. I mean, that's what I get branded as in in online and in, in mainstream networks. So for him to recognize that what I was doing with this book and with my reporting was really just honest and about the facts and for him to make that statement in support of me it was 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 really uh, important to me and so i want people to understand who he is especially when they read those endorsements that this isn't just about as you say trying to convince the same people of you know i'm not trying to preach to the choir i i, I hope to reach an audience that may have not formally been interested in Venezuela and understand how make help them understand how it relates to other issues they care about most of all the quality of life in our own country